please. I mean, you all know Steve, I know, because he's already addressed most of you, I suppose, and that's why you're here, and you've placed uh, a lot of trust in him. But for the next five days, be kind to him, be good to him. <laughs> Don't beat him up, because he'll take it out of me. But please, let's give a really, really big warm, really big, big warm <laughs> thank you to Mr Stephen Molnar. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. OK. Thank you, Michael. In terms of syndicates, why would you actually want to work in a syndicate? What do you think the power is of a syndicate? Is it knowledge? Yeah, that's part of it. Leverage. Oh, so you said leverage. Okay. So let me just write that up. Can I go to flip charts, please? What else is there? Yeah, that, that's part of leverage, yep, bigger deals. Motivation, thank you. That is actually probably one of the most important things. Uh, if you've never heard me speak before, um, I apologise up front if I misspell words. I'm not, I'm a science teacher by training, not a, t so if I misspell anything, please, is that, is that all right? Will you forgive me? Yeah. Great, uh, no. <laughs> all right, um, leverage, knowledge, motivation. There's another aspect to it as well, and that's timing. and momentum. Now, if you think about our lives, do we have busy lives, yes or no? Sorry? Yes, yes you've got to play full out, all right? We are very busy in life, and often when we learn some great things, you want to take advantage of them, we may not necessarily be able to take advantage of them because we get busy with maybe, you know, raising children or a job or, or new training um, for work or for travel or something like that. So often when you're actually working in a team with people, you can do all these things. But there's something else that's actually much, much more important. When you work in a syndicate, and whether that syndicate is with you or someone else or a larger group of people, there is something that's actually more important than, in fact, all of those. Does anyone know what it is? Shared vision. You're on the right track. What comes after vision? Think about that. It's part of motivation, but it's actually beyond motivation. It's beyond action. It happens as part of action. Has anyone ever promised their spouse that they would take out the rubbish and not done it? What happens then? You are held accountable. Okay, so it's this level of accountability. Whether it's a syndicate of yourself and your best friend, your spouse, your parents, your children, whatever, you are held accountable. And you see, is it possible to have all of these sorts of things and not be held accountable. If you're not held accountable, generally you don't get the maximised results. Does that make sense? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to be put together in syndicates. The syndicates will be based along state lines because my ultimate goal for you guys is to meet on a regular basis. Maybe whether you choose to do it online um, or whether I think it's better in person, but you might want to meet every month or just email each other every week or something like that. Certainly this is a year-long program. You'll be seeing me on a regular basis. You'll be seeing me every quarter. I'll be giving you a quarterly update as to what's going on in the market. I'll be answering your questions at your level. You'll hear from other people that are in similar positions to yourselves who'll be asking questions that may actually spur other things. Or is it possible that they're a little bit further down the same line that you're going? Yes or no? Right? And you may actually be able to leverage from that. So these are the sorts of elements of why we're going to be doing syndicates. Now, there's, has anyone ever said this to you that there's, there's always another level? Has anyone ever heard that? <laughs> All right. Well, let's just talk about the levels of syndication because understanding this will actually understand, give you a bit of a blueprint as to where you're moving towards. All right. So levels of syndication. At this advanced level, you're at level zero. And what I mean by that is just to get to here, you've probably learned a whole lot of things, such as at my two-day event, you've probably implemented some of you a bit further down the track, some of you not quite as far down. But in terms of syndication, you're probably at level zero. So at this event, what we'll be doing is there'll be some information that you may have heard somewhere in the past, maybe some of the topics you may have even heard at the two-day event where I touched on them. 
At this event, I'm actually going to go into detail. The two-day event is really giving you some, some of the overview. This is to give you the nitty-gritty Right, the exact how-to, plus we're going to give you a whole lot of extra topics in this as well. But most importantly, we're going to give you a lot of experiential learning. Does that make sense? Yep. Hello? Yes. Great. So you're at level zero, and you can actually use this info for yourself to get greater deals. Right, that's level zero in terms of syndication. You can learn some information, get some better things for you because you've learned some better things from others and you've been motivated by them. But at the minimum, what I want you to do is walk out of here with level one. And that's sharing time and knowledge. So imagine this. Imagine, put, all, put your hands up again, all the New South Wales people. But put your hands up. Roughly how many is there? There's probably, ooh, I don't know, 30. Would that be about right? that look like 30? 40. Okay, let's say it's 40. Just think about this. If you were buying one property, could you get a good deal, yes or no, with lots of knowledge? Yes. But if you were buying 40 in one hit, could you get a better deal irrespective of your knowledge, yes or no? Yes or no? Absolutely. So what I want you to be able to do is walk out of here with the level of knowledge of the dynamics of how a team works together and be able to negotiate in a single group and do a 40 takeout. Where, as the group, you share no money. You just share time, knowledge, and you go together, decide what you want, get clear on your outcomes, elect one or two people to represent you, and they negotiate the deal. Because that's how syndicates happen in the real world. 40 people don't show up in a boardroom and negotiate with one agent. Does that make sense? All right? So... Can you, can you see the benefits of being able to do that? Well, there's actually some pain involved with that. Is it possible to have some people in your syndicate that uh, have different personality characteristics than yourself? Yes or no? Yes. Has anyone ever worked with people before and sometimes had a, a few little issues with those people? Has, anyone, has that ever happened? Well, I want you to think about this. What is the upside of working with other people, with teaming up with other people? Can you get a substantially better result than you could simply by yourself? Yes or no? So is it worth going to that trouble, yes or no? Okay, so as a minimum, because what happens at, at level one is because you're sharing time and information, you're not sharing any money whatsoever. If someone lets you down, will you get over it? A whole lot easier as if you'd actually spent money with them, yes or no? Right, does that make sense? So this, that's why I want you to think about this, is that that's level one. You're just sharing some time and knowledge. You're getting together maybe physically on a monthly basis. Maybe you're sharing some group emails. Maybe you have a blog site. Maybe you do something like that. You allocate some tasks. So some people are actually researching some areas. Some people are finding out what's happening at council. Some are finding out what's happening from infrastructure. Some people are interviewing real estate agents, those sorts of things, to form a clear body of knowledge so you can make the most informed decision. Are we okay with that? Yes or no? Yeah. Right. Level one goes on to level two. And level two is where you start doing debt equity partnerships. Debt equity partnerships or joint ventures. So let me give you an example. With now the power and the buying capacity of your team with the knowledge then, after a period of time, bless you, could you have actually sorted out who you want to deal with and who you don't really want to deal with? Yes or no? Someone who's on the same page as you is going to be much easier to deal with on the long-term basis. So you may actually find that, as an example, if you're young, you might have good cash flow, but maybe if you're a bit older, you've got lots of equity, but the banks are limiting you just to how many more you can keep buying. Remember, in life, we're all going to hit obstacles in life. It's what you choose to do after that, whether you keep going or whether you stay still. There's always another level, there's always another way. So once you get past level one, you might actually start moving up to level two where you've got people in your team that you are happy, comfortable with in doing these debt equity partnerships where one person kicks in some equity, another person takes on some debt, they go 50-50 and off they go. Now, at the end of these five days, what I'm going to do is going to give you the contracts for this and go into a lot more detail, but this... This by itself can actually just keep you moving. Because would you agree that 50% of something is a whole lot better than 100% of nothing? Would you agree with that? If you understand this, what this can also do is it can substantially diversify your geographic and specific risk. 
Now, I'm going to go into risks later on into more detail, but can you imagine this? 100% of one property, you're limited to that. Whereas if you had two properties, your specific risk, your geographic risk, and even your cash flow risk are now diminished. Who follows that? Okay. Now, is there another level beyond level two? Maybe, maybe there's what? There's always another level. So level three. What's level three? This is where you do a real syndication. This is where you do something like a unit trust. Now, at this level, obviously this is a more sophisticated level, but if you have the right team of people around you, could you progress to this relatively quickly? If you find people in your syndicate, your team, your buying power group, maybe you find half a dozen that are switched on, that are on the same page as you, could you, with them, team up Create one of these or something similar because there are some other structures like in New Zealand could be an LAQC. There's a number of different structures. I'm not suggesting which is the right structure for you. Who's the right person for that? Start with your accountant. You may need to go to a solicitor, but I would start with your accountant. Okay? But certainly you would progress to this. Now imagine this. Imagine you're buying, a, you're doing a takeout, a whole line takeout of maybe 20, 30, 40 apartments, townhouses, or houses. Do you know what the massive advantage of doing it a unit trust is? Because once you get to this level, does anyone belong to a social club or a sporting club or something like that? Okay. Is anyone a director or treasurer or anything like that? You are? Okay. Well, you probably know that sporting clubs can actually do borrowings without director's guarantees. So, What's the possibility here at the unit trust level? Can you imagine this? You actually create a separate entity to yourselves that has its own CRA, its own borrowing capacity, and does not rely on your personal guarantees. So it does not affect your balance sheet, does not affect your actual or contingent liabilities. Now, what does that allow you to do? Does it does it then develop a life of its own and off it goes buying on behalf of the unit holders? Yes or no? Right Now, think about this. That could actually multiply your personal borrowing capacity. You've got your own independent borrowing capacity, maybe your own structures. Then you've got another structure that you're a member of, and it's going along doing the buying for you as part of a whole unit group. And let's say it's done a couple of deals. By the way, what do you think would be the next level beyond that? Because is there another level? There's always another level. What do you think the next level beyond a unit trust level would be? What do you think would be the next natural progression? And let me give you an example of companies already doing this. Multiplex, Babcock and Brown, Macquarie Bank. What do you think they do at the next level up beyond this? Because we're going to be teaching you some of the concepts that, that take you as far as you want to go. And that's why it's a year-long program. We're going to be constantly doing assessments with you. And I'll explain all that as we go through. There's like 13 modules of assessments and there's um, quarterly updates from me and there's a chance for you to come back to a lot, lot more stuff. There's, there's plenty that you guys will need and will be given to keep in that zone. But what do you think the next level is? I'm, I'm sorry? Not quite going public. The step before that, someone else said it. Bringing other, uh, thank you, other people's money, bringing other people in. At level four, can you imagine this? If your syndicate has actually done a number of takeouts, shown that they've made money, could you approach someone else and say, listen, we are willing to split the profits with you 50-50. We've got the knowledge. We've got the expertise here. We can show you that we can do it. You put in the money, we'll go 50-50. Then how many deals can you do after that? Unlimited. It's unlimited. All right? So this is a unit trust... JV with an investor. And these are all the levels that you can actually go to. And we're going to be showing you what's involved with this. But you see, you need to start at the beginning. Where's the beginning? You need to deal with people. Because property is a what business? It's a people business. So before we commence, what I want you to do is I want you to put your books down.
I want you to, in your chairs, stand up, turn to the people around you, introduce yourself, big smile on your dial, tell them what you're looking for, tell them why you're here, welcome them and ask them what they're looking for. I want you to meet like four new people, everybody up, 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 put your books down, meet new people. Hopefully, you're all here looking for kind of the same thing. Hopefully. Hopefully. What are you here to get? Thank you. <laughs> to make money. Can I go to flip charts, please? <laughs> to make money. Now, few people said to get knowledge, and all of those things are fantastic. They are part of the end result. To make money, is that an end result or is that a vehicle? Well, it's actually an end result. Part of your bigger life is why do you want the money, then it becomes a vehicle. Does that make sense? So, at the two-day event... We, we did a bit of a dreams building, what you're looking for and why, so we've done all of that. We actually quantified. Remember, at the two-day event, and for some of you it may seem like a little while ago now, right? But we talked about what do you want out of um, the two-day. We then talked about your goals, beliefs. We then quantified it down to some numbers. I'm not going to go over that. It's in the manuals here, so you can do it later on if you choose to. But what this event is really about is how do you make money at the whole next level? And the next level involves you leveraging off other people as part of your team. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, come on, you've got to play full out. Yes? Yeah. Great. So, whatever you choose to do with that money, as we covered at the two-day, whether it's to provide financial security to yourself and your family, whether it's to provide opportunities, whether it's to contribute greater to other people, whether it's to travel, whether it's to buy Harley-Davidson's, I don't care. That's your call. Whatever you choose it to be, just make it meaningful and juicy and fulfilling for you. Otherwise, you will not follow through with it. Does that make sense? That's all I want to say about it. Now, if you open up your manuals to the very front page, there is a timetable on there. Now, is it good to have a timetable as a very rough guide? <laughs> yes or no? Yes. yes. Now, you will notice that... Um, on days two, three, four, and five, we start at 8.30, all right? Now, so bear that in mind. Today, we wanted to give you some time for registration. We knew we had people flying in from interstate. Um, so that's why today we started at nine to give you plenty of time for that. Now, you'll also see throughout these five days that I have organised for you some guest speakers. And I've got some brilliant guest speakers. But I want to tell you something about some of these guest speakers. They are industry practitioners, they are very good at what they know. However, their main job is not to present information, right? Their main job is to use that information and get results for themselves and for their clients. So they, they don't have a science teaching background, as an example, right? So I really need you to be open to some of them have brilliant content. Some of them have even um, provided some additional content in the back of the books, right, so that we can then have further reading, particularly the tax people, and the tax stuff is fascinating, right, but as you can appreciate, um, there's a lot of information to be gleaned from the tax area and the structures area, and they can't present that in the time frame they have of, of a couple of hours, so there's, there's things like um, that that I'll give you, and I'll give you that as homework to do, all right, just so you can have some fun at night reading things about the tax system. Right? I've got some other homework in there that I'll give you later on, which will be about the town planning process, so you can actually understand all of those bits and pieces. Now, why do you need to understand them? Well, would you agree that you want to be in a syndicate with people like yourself, people that are educated, people willing and open to learn some things, yes or no? Would you agree that type of syndicate and that level of syndicate will achieve the best results? Would you agree with that? Right? So not only do you have to self hold yourself accountable, but you want to be around people like that as well. And in fact, later on, we will show you a way, and we're going to help you create a way that your syndicate can actually grow substantially. I'm going to cover that as we go through, because if you can make your group and your syndicate grow, can you then get even better and better deals, yes or no? Yeah. Right? That's what my job is. I'm going to help you do that. I'll show you that as we go through. Now, as I said, some of those um, speakers are great speakers and their time is very precious. Because of that, where they're slotted in to this program is not 
exactly where I'll be covering that topic. It's where we could get them. Does that make sense? So we might have someone talking about tax but, oh, and structures, but I may have already talked about it or I'm about to talk about it. All I'm going to do is pre-frame you on that, tell you specifically what to look for, and once they're finished, I'm going to tell you how can you use it to do what? To make money, Right? Because some of these industry practitioners don't necessarily look at their information from that perspective. But I'm going to help you translate it to say, okay, now that you've learned this, how do you put it into action? What are some examples of where you'd use this to get a better result? Does everybody follow that? Okay. So wherever they're in, that's where they'll be speaking. Um, we have a field trip, which is um, one of the, probably the most exciting parts of this program. So you get to go out in the field on buses, you get to see sites, you get to negotiate with people, and to get to that end result is exactly what you'd have to do in real life. You will have to elect a number of people from your syndicate to negotiate on your behalf. Right, You will, before that happens, have to understand who are the people. There'll be some natural leaders in your team. There'll be some people that are natural negotiators. There'll be some people that are like this with the information. And there'll be some people that aren't. Okay? So you will, this is why it's really important you get to meet people, you know what team they're in, and that you have breakfast and, sorry, lunch and morning tea and afternoon tea with them, because you will have to elect them. They'll negotiate on your behalf. But before they get to that point, you as a syndicate will have to give them a mandate. Right? This is exactly what happens in the real world when a syndicate wants to get a better result. We've talked about why syndicates are so important. To get an optimised result, you have to get to a consensus. Correct? You have to agree on something and then be specific enough to give someone some instructions. You are negotiating between these bounds, off you go, right? So they know they have your full support. Then they'll negotiate to that level and come back and report back to you. And based on what they report back to you, you're going to have to make some further decisions, modify your negotiations and recreate their mandate. Does that make sense? Right? Now, guess what happens in the real world? Exactly that. They'll go to the developers or real estate agents and negotiate on your behalf. And that's the process we actually want you to go through, to actually understand that. And the results that Michael said um, we got last week, there were people in the audience, smaller group than this, but they made, but some of them made between forty dollars and $50,000 on that week. So is it possible? Absolutely. Because we saw it happen just last week. Well, week and a half, actually. So... Once we do all the morning tea breaks, lunchtime tea breaks, it's really important you get around, you meet people, you press the flesh, you understand who they are, you, you talk to them, you tell them what you know, you listen to what they know, because for you to get the most out of this, you need to not only be listening, taking furious notes, but teaching others and sharing it with them, because that drives it deeper into you, all right? And by learning the language of developers, by learning the language of bankers, by learning the language of architects, you become a professional at doing this. Does that make sense? So some of you might think, this information's a little bit dry. Always ask yourself a better question. How can I use this to do what? To make money. That's what you should always be asking yourself. You need to motivate yourself. You need to keep yourself fully present as we go through all of this. In fact, I want you to just um, write this down. doesn't matter where you write it down. But there are teachability levels. And you need to be fully present. As Michael said, you need to be fully present. And in fact, you need to decide what level are you at and what level do you need to be at to get the most out of these five days. The first level, which is primitive level, at this level there is a large resistance to change in any way. The individual never adjusts to the situation. You're not going to get the results and you don't choose a new form of behaviour. You have little awareness of your own behaviour at this level. Obviously, no one in this room is at this level. No one. But is it possible that sometimes, unless we're in the best environment, we may relapse into a previous level of motivation and teachability? Yes or no? Okay. Number two, the next level up from that is the resistance level. You resist until are threatened or put under extreme pressure. Now, who knows some people around them that don't want to move, don't want to shift. Sometimes this happens at home with kids, with, with parents, with siblings, with spouses. Sometimes it happens at work. That once you put them under extreme pressure, and sometimes it's a bank that does this or it's legal or whatever, 
right? Or maybe you've been through some traumatic experience and you put yourself under this pressure, but you don't naturally change until you get this extreme level of pressure. That is the resistance level. Right, the third level of teachability is the adaptive level. You react and with a wait and see attitude, and if it works, then you adjust quickly. Okay, and I would imagine that many of you are probably at this level already, or the next level up. Right, you're always a little bit late, the world is a bit ahead of you, you're first to resist, and then quickly adapt. I know some of you are at that level, particularly if you've come as a guest, you're not even sure what this is about. We're here to teach you some really advanced things about property and get you to learn a process that will set you up for the rest of your life if you choose to use it. What did I just say? If you choose to use it. Can I force you to use it? No. Who's it up to if you want to use it? Yourself. Because let me tell you, I know a lot of people who've used the skills that I'm about to teach you, use them over and over again. And when they do flips and trades and deals, they'll make thirty to maybe 100000 per deal. But you see, they have to want to do it. doesn't matter what you know up here, unless you're willing to do it, there is no result. The fourth level, and I'm imagining the vast majority of you are in this level or just about to hit this level, is you relate well to other people, circumstances and events. You openly pursue new information. You're actively reaching out and seeking. You choose your behaviour not based on the past because what you find in the here and now at this moment. Your behaviour shows that you realise there is always more to be learnt and you're willing to go to the next level. Now, important part of you getting to the next level is the success spiral, right? You have to have beliefs and attitude. You have to understand that there are different ways of doing things. From getting to A to B, is there more than one way, yes or no? Absolutely. Now, understanding that unleashes your potential. And by unleashing your potential and being motivated and often being accountable to somebody else outside of you that is near and dear to you, that's when you start getting action. And even if you get the wrong, even if you take the wrong action and make a mistake, is that better than procrastinating and never taking any action, yes or no? Much better. Because once you've taken one action that's wrong, you can quickly adjust and take better action. Who would agree with that? Okay? And then slowly you actually get right exactly on path and then you get results and feedback. And you know what happens? Is when you get really good results and feedback and people tell you you've done well, guess what happens then? Your belief and act attitude improves substantially. And that actually is a success spiral. It feeds itself. But you've got to set yourself up to win that game. That's why that Chinese proverb I often quote is a journey of a thousand miles starts with the first steps. You do the first little steps and those little steps turn into much bigger and longer steps and that journey just starts unfolding very easily in front of you. Does that make sense? Okay. What I want to do now is I want to really give you a reference of our psychology and what's possible particularly with property. Because remember we said there's always another level? Well... Let's just talk about, and this is what I call turns on an asset. Now, I'll give you a quick example. Um, Qantas. Who's heard of Qantas? Right? What is, what's Qantas in the business of? Some people think it's to sell airline tickets. It's to make money. Is there more than one way to make money through their business, yes or no? Yes. All right? So they have an asset, and they actually ask themselves all the time, how do we get a greater result? How do we get a broader return or multiple returns off the same asset? Is that, excuse me, is that a really empowering, open-ended, positive question to ask, yes or no? Yes. Right? So not only do they send people on planes as airline tickets, what else can they sell people? Freight? Maybe if you want to ship something from, say, London to Australia if, you, if you're an expat. But what else do they do? How else do they get another return off their same asset? In fact, let me ask you, what is one of their biggest assets? Does anybody know? I used to work at Qantas, so I know a bit about this. But does anyone know what one of their biggest assets is that you, that you wouldn't necessarily un see as a, a big asset? 
No. Something else? Thank, who said that? Thank you. Very smart. Customer list. They have got a massive customer database where they know lots and lots and lots of things about their customers. So what they do is their, their database is their asset and they ask themselves, how do we get another turn off the same asset? Does that make sense? So we can sell them airline tickets, but can we value add and sell them more stuff? What's your name, sir? Lena. Lena. So Lena, can we put more value and sell them other things? Lena, what if we sold them holidays, packaged holidays? Would that be another turn off the same asset? Yes or no? Lena... Could we also sell them home loans through Macquarie Bank and ANZ? Because with some of those people, would they want home loans? Yes or no? And based on their level of activity and whether they're bronze, silver, gold, platinum, do we know roughly whether they make a bit of money or not? So could we have targeted advertising? Yes or no? Lena, could we even get them into a wine club? Right? Lena, what else? What about car hire? I'm sure some of those people who travel would need car hire right? And holidays. In fact, we could even sell them rooms in hotels, correct? What else could they sell? Credit cards. Can you see that what they look at is that one asset and they ask themselves a wonderful question. How many returns can we get off the same asset? And that's usually called turns, right? Does that make sense? Now, Here's my question to you, because I want to shock your psychology. I want to get this event really kicking along. I want to ask you, on a property, how many turns can you get off the same asset when it comes to property, i.e. property? So, could you get, number one, capital growth? Yes or no? All right, so capital growth. I'm going to write up the ones that most people come up with. Capital growth. Number two, can you get rent? Okay, number three, can you get depreciation? Okay, keep going. And let me, let me just tell you something. Most people, 99% of the population would top out at that. And in fact, <laughs> sorry, most would probably come up with one or two and just capital growth and rent and not everyone would come up with depreciation. But is there more returns off the same asset? What else? Just, just yell them out. You don't have to put your hands up, but, but I'm a man, so one at a time, please. Okay, all right, number four. Um, actually, I'm going to just leave that for a moment. Tell me some of the other returns you can get. Thank you. Rezoning. Yep, what else? Uh, okay, renovation is um, capital growth and rent. Redevelop. Okay, that's, that's actually good. Um, I'm going to put that as uh, subdivide. Subdivide plus redevelop. Redevelop. No, rezoning could be different to subdivide. No, it's, redif it's different. Because... Yeah, but you can add value by rezoning and sell it rezoned. You've added value. All right? You don't have to subdivide. You can give that to someone else and or redevelop. Does that make sense? Oh, now we're cooking. Air rights. Sorry? Okay. Um, actually, I'm going to take redividing off there and because you can just get DAs. Um, because you can actually get something, go through council, right, that you may not need to rezone for, but you can actually put a DA in, get it approved, and sell it with DA approval. Does that make sense? All right, so DA, um, and, and this is called different things in different jurisdictions, but I'm just going to put permits. All right? Strata. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to go through mine. Guess how long my list is? <laughs> Take a guess. 20? Yeah, it's 50. And some of the things I'm going to show you, you're going to say, I never even thought of that. I never even thought of that. I didn't know about that. The whole purpose of this is what I want you to now start thinking of is whenever you see a property as an asset, I want you to ask yourself, right, in the past I had a tool belt with maybe three tools in it. But now I want you to start thinking, as a syndicate, I have massive power and our, each of our tool belts has 50 tools in it. So what else can we do? And every single one of these things I'm going to say to you, I know people or companies actually doing and I have an overriding belief, a global belief. And that global belief is 
If it's possible for someone else, is it possible for me? Yes or no? Absolutely. And when you're a part of a syndicate, some of the things, this is the exciting thing about being part of a syndicate, in some cases the risk or the knowledge was just too difficult doing it by yourself. But as when you're part of a syndicate, let me ask you this, could your whole syndicate do one of them and share the risk for one property, but also share all the learning, yes or no? Would that be a smart thing to do? Absolutely. All right. Imagine this. Imagine 40 of you getting in there doing one reno. Could you get... No, seriously. Could you get 80% of the learning, right, and take one fortieth of the risk? Yes or no? Okay? And that's the way you've got to start thinking because if you learn something from that syndicate, does anything stop you implementing it at level zero in your own world? Yes or no? Of course you can. All right? So, anyway, I'm just going to go through all these right now. Um... Got that one, um, equity use. Who remembers Stephen's circle of wealth? Oh, what, five people? <laughs> Come on, who remembers Stephen's circle of wealth? Where basically you can borrow some of your equity out and you can potentially even reinvest it somewhere else. And who remembers the term arbitrage? Who remembers that? Okay, All right, so you actually pull it out at maybe 8%, reinvest it maybe wherever you feel comfortable, at maybe 9, 10, 11% or more. All right. Who makes the difference? You do. But obviously get some advice from a financial planner before you do that. So equity use. Um, all right. And you could actually use that for things such as mezzanine, for shares, for business, etc. Okay. All right. Number eight. No, that was eight. Oh. Okay, I can't count either. All right, seven, eight. Oh, look, there's over 50. Let's just leave it at that. There's over 50 of them. All right, um, we got that one. Um, number nine, whatever it is, higher LVR. Right, and the higher LVR, with or without um, LMI, allows you to use more of that equity use. Um, number 10, we've had depreciation. Um, and you could also put in that 2036 form. So rather than getting your depreciation every at the end of the year, you get it on a cash flow basis every month. Um, so that's tax regularly. Number 11, could you get um, depreciation by putting a, uh, a white goods package in? White goods. Number 12, depreciation with a Furniture package, furniture package. And I'll explain all of these as we go in detail. Um, number 13, could you maximise the depreciation? And for the two-day event, you'll remember how I talked about that. We'll have a quantity surveyor in, and we'll talk more about that as we go through. Number 14, um, it's the negative gearing tax deduction, and that's particularly important for um, JVs, debt equity partnerships, because you may be out of tax credits, but the other person has got them. Um, could you use deposit bonds from multiple lenders? Multiple lenders to secure additional properties, multiple lenders. 16 deposit bonds. Um, rental return, rental return. Could you maximise that um, by value adding? 17, rental return. Um, and that's rental rebate. I'll explain that as we go through. Actually, I'll just quickly mention this one. Um, who remembers from the two-day event, I actually said um, the way banks calculate your borrowing capacity is they only take into account um, whatever your loan is. They usually do a sensitivity analysis. They add 1% or 2%. They convert it from interest only to P&I, and they only take in 70% of the rent. Who remembers me talking about that? Well, um, I know someone, and this is one of the things they do, is they do a rental rebate. So let's say the rent is um, 200, but its net is 50 because they give them back $50 a week at the end of each month as long as they may, they've paid on time um, and they get to inspect the property regularly to make sure it's in good nick. Does that make sense? 
All right, but what does that do? Because 200 is actually booked on the agent's statement, it actually massively improves their borrowing capacity. Does that make sense? I'm not saying what's right or wrong, you need to check it out for your own jurisdiction, but that's a way that they're getting a greater return off the same asset because they understand the system really well. All right, uh, next is factoring. Um, some of you may never have heard of factoring. Unless you're in business banking, you wouldn't. Um, who's heard of a company? Actually, let me, let me put it a different way. If you have a business that has very strong cash flows, is that an asset, yes or no? Okay, it's a very strong asset. And in fact, banks are willing to lend against that, and it's usually called factoring or um, invoice discounting, right? As an example, Coca-Cola, who's heard of Coca-Cola? They factor all their invoices, which means they go to a lender and say, how much will you lend us against this? They generally lend about 80%. Um, they charge a small amount of margin. What that does is it puts cash straight back into their pocket. Why are banks willing to do that? Because they know that it's for... Um, those invoices are spread across a very wide selection of debtors, right? They're for small amounts. They pay regularly, right? So there's no concentration of cash flow risk. So based on that, because it's so diversified and it's a small amount and they're regular payers, the bank feels that there's a very high probability those invoices will be paid. Who follows that? Right? And because of that, they're willing to lend. So it now becomes, that cash flow becomes an independent asset as opposed to the capital growth. So in a property, can you imagine this? If you have a wide number of properties that are paying on a regular basis and you don't have concentration of any cash flow risk, is that a smart thing? Could you then even go to a bank and get lending against that? Now, it may be that you need to have more than a certain number, but it's a way that you could aspire to getting that sort of number. All right, next. And by the way, um, who's heard of Meriton here in um, New South Wales? Right? Um, Mr. Triggerboff there, he has lots of rental properties. He has hundreds in his own personal name. Do you think that because he has diversity of income streams from different tenants, that that now allows him to be at a critical mass where he can do factoring off, off his rents, yes or no? You won't be able to do it off two or five or ten, but you may get to a point later on where you can actually do that. By the way, who, who's actually, actually even heard of factoring? Yeah, not a lot of people. All right, next. Um, Naming rights for a building. Because remember, as a syndicate, you're not limited to just doing residential, are you? You could do mixed-use developments, correct? And some mixed-use developments could be residential and could be commercial. Could you even get to the point where you just do commercial, yes or no? Because there's a whole, lot of, there's a whole different body of knowledge to be gained um, before you need to do that. But some buildings actually have naming rights on them. So naming rights, um, 20, rent car park separate, rent car park separate. In major capital cities, does it cost a lot to park your car, yes or no? Some councils, when they make sure that people live there, they make sure that there is a car space, a secured car space, um, for each of the units, or the units are specifically sold without a car space, never to have a car space, and they, they're never eligible to get car space permits or things like that. Does that make sense? Now, in some capital cities, particularly notably Sydney, Melbourne, they even do this out of Parramatta, um, you can actually split and separately lease your car space. So imagine this. You could rent, and there's actually websites that facilitate you doing this. It's a bit like realestate.com.au, but there's one specifically for car spaces, where people who want to drive their cars into the city can do long-term leases, like six to 12 months, of people who live in the city, have a car space, but don't have a car, right? Now, think about this. Could you rent your property, and, and really, by splitting things up like that, you could actually improve your overall yield, because who you're likely to rent your car space to may be a business, but more likely a business person who's probably claiming it back and doesn't really care how much it costs. If they're going to drive in the city, they're not that worried. At least you're going to be cheaper than commercial car parking. Does that make sense? All right? So 21. Storage. The box thing. .com.au. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard... Has anyone heard of the box thing? All right. 
let me just give you a quick diagram of what it sort of looks like. Actually, I'll just... The box thing looks a bit like this. If this is the wall and this is your car... All right, that's your car, right? I'm a very... I know it's a third grade drawing. But um, the box thing sort of sits um, out from here and it sort of looks, sits like that against the wall. So you have storage here and here and it's fully lockable and it's made of steel, right? But because it's got legs, actually the car sort of pokes in more than that. There's, there's a couple of different models, a couple of different manufacturers who make this. But let me ask you this. Could you put a box thing in... Do people have more stuff nowadays, right? And is storage a premium, particularly as apartments are smaller, yes or no? Could having the box thing that you put into your car park spot that they can store things securely give them greater benefit, yes or no? Are people willing to pay for that greater benefit, yes or no? Are these sorts of things depreciable, yes or no? Of course they are. Now, there's that, but number 22 is build a cage. Now, think about this. Could you have a cage, right, with wire mesh with your tilter door so that anything they put in there, they just lock the tilter door, is now fully secure, yes or no? And they can hang things off hooks from the, um, the wire mesh, right? So it's a full, fully enclosed cage. Now, how can you use that? Well, I'll give you a really good example. If you're a syndicate, and I actually did this on one development, I got my car space swapped with someone else, right? Because I got in early enough, because I knew what my outcome was, right? Because I knew all my skills, all my tools, and I thought, I want to tweak this little bit and get a better result. So there was a car spot, right? And it looked a bit like this. Right? Um, and that was really the length of the car spot. And that was a fixed masonry wall. Does that make sense so far? So that's car, pay, that's car space one, that's car space two. Now, I got my car space swap because before he put in his, um, his um, draft strata plan, before it was approved, I got my car space swapped. So what? Well, by having the one next to the masonry wall, I didn't have to build one of the long sides of the cage. Does that make sense? Right? And the cage in between, the wall in between, I actually contacted the other person. We went halves on that. They were more than happy with that. And I actually got all this extra space here because the wall underground where they dug it out wasn't flat. And that's why it was more important to me. To save costs, I had a masonry wall and I got some, some free space for free. Does that make sense? So it's, it's maximising every little option that you've got. And that's what you've got to be thinking of, is by using all the skills, if you get 1% better here and 1% better here and 1% better here, and at the end of these 50-odd, if you can get 1% better all the way through, what does that compound to? An extraordinarily better result. Okay? Okay, where are we up to? Um, 23. 23. Okay. First home buyer's scheme. Some people don't use it or aren't aware of how to use it the most effective way. Um, first, solar water plus rebates. There's a whole lot of um, six-star energy efficient stuff. Do you know that you can actually build houses now that are specified a five-star or higher ratings and you can get rebates back from federal and state level? Okay. So solar, solar um, heating is probably um, one of the best examples. Um, this one I'm going to shock you with, nuclear dump. Do you think, hang on, there's no way I can use a nuclear get dump, but are people like the South Australian government wanting to do a nuclear dump? Yes or no? Right? So, slash clean fill site. Now, is that more likely to be a benefit to you. If you're doing a large development site and maybe land banking to start off with, could you actually offer your site for clean fill purposes? Yes or no? All right? You may not be able to do the nuclear dump site, but you may be able to charge people to put clean fill on your site from earthworks and excavations. All right? Um, 26. 
exchange of currency. Now, what does that mean? Well, who's heard the term accession to the European Union? Who's heard of that? Okay, so change of currency, e.g. accession, accession to EU. Give you a really interesting example. Um, what's it called? Not Macedonia. Um, Serbia. One of the Balkan states, not Serbia, but the other one that was... No, it wasn't Croatia. Bosnia, I think it was. No, it wasn't Bosnia. It's that little one with all the hills. Montenegro, that's the one, yeah, with all the mountains, right? Um, anyway, it's, um, um, it's going to be... Um, it's on the list for EU accession, right? Now, this is some of the interesting things that happen in Europe, that before a country accedes, right... Um, it's got old currency, things are its normal prices for the local population. If you go to countries that are maybe Eastern Bloc or previously Eastern Bloc, um, you can actually pick up bargains. I remember, because I'm Hungarian, a lot of Germans, before the EU accession came in, flooded into Hungary and bought all these amazing holiday homes. In fact, the English did as well. There's one village that's just about all English people, right? Um, and they bought it at pre-EU currency revaluation. So they actually got in at a really cheap price. So I want you to think as investors, maybe Australia is not the only place, maybe not just New Zealand, are the only place you can actually make money. But I want you to think about these things often that only happen once in a lifetime. Okay? But do people make money out of it? Absolutely. And you may feel more comfortable doing that as a group or as a syndicate than you could ever by yourself because you may have within that group or syndicate people of all different contacts. Um, FTAs, free trade agreements. Australia has free trade agreements with certain countries such as Singapore, Singapore, New Zealand, etc. Could you use some of the benefits of that free trade to get um, ownership into easier structures or maybe getting loans into easier structures based on the free trade, free trade agreement? Um, 28, foreign loans. Now, foreign loans are a very difficult thing to do, and I'm not saying that you should even look at them, but do some people get loans, and I know some expats have actually specifically done this, they've gotten their loans denominated in a different currency, but they've also made sure that they've paid the foreign exchange premium to hedge any problems. Does that make sense? Unlike um, the poor farmers that Westpac got into foreign loans a long time ago, they never hedged those, which meant that as the Australian dollar fell and they were denominated, I think it was in US dollars, their bills went through the roof. They weren't hedged. Okay? So foreign loans. Make sure you do the hedging, the FX hedge. 29... Okay, buy with trade dollars. Who's a member of Bartercard? Okay, you'll know in Bartercard that there's often properties that come up for sale and you can pay maybe up to 20, it's usually no more than 20, but occasionally I've seen one, one or two above that. But you can buy a property 20% on trade dollars. Up to 40 yeah, it's, 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 look, common is 20, sometimes I've seen 30, but it's very rare to get beyond that. Now, later on, I'm going to tell you why they do that and how you can take advantage of that because there's a couple of reasons why you can take advantage of it. But I just want to list up here all the different sorts of things. So next is... 30 is change from P&I to interest-only loans. That'll improve your cash flow. This is all about all the different ways you can get the, a better return off the same asset. Um, 31, change from standard to honeymoon rates. Because often to cash flow a property in the first couple of years, that's when it's hardest. Um, get a professional choice package, save up to 0.07% as a, as a minimum, 33, rent it out over summer. Now, um, 
e.g. Palm Beach, Olympics. Give an example. Who was, um, remember the Olympics we had here in 2000 in Sydney? Oh, no. Nah. <laughs> All right. When we had the Olympics here, um, there was some people in Piermont that rented their apartments to the Japanese weightlifting team. Right? It was in the paper. And they made in a week, right, the equivalent of like half a year's worth of um, rent. It was just some extraordinary, extraordinary number because in yen, it was cheap anyway. Right? So they bought these new properties. They got literally six months worth of rent, you know, every week while they were here. They were only here for maybe, you know, what is it, four weeks or whatever. But could that have set them up for, a, um, you know, to keep that property long term? Yes or no? Now, who's heard of Palm Beach and Baron Joey Light Lighthouse? Who's heard of Palm Beach? Up in Palm Beach, it's very exclusive up there. And in fact, what a lot of people do on Palm Beach is that over summer, they just rent their houses out. They move out for a couple of weeks or a month. They rent them out to, you know, people like the Packers or um, movie stars like Tom Cruise. These people flood in. They want to be left alone. They want to be up. And there's some amazing restaurants up there. Um, I think Jonas is up there and places like that, and they get an enormous amount of rent just for that short period of time. There's some places down um, um, in Victoria that do the same thing way along the bay as well. So making sure that you can actually have a property that allows you to do that is a way to get an extra return on it. Um, oh, the Indy, of course, yeah. yeah. Um, and the, the Grand Prix in Melbourne, some of the properties facing that. Absolutely, but don't know how long they'll have the Grand Prix for because it's just losing them so much money um, here in Melbourne. Okay, um, what am I up to? 34. Clay mining. Well, do people mine clay? Yeah, for brickworks and stuff like that, absolutely. So 35. Um, change. Hang on, change street address. Okay, I'll give you an example. Um, the property that I used to have who, um, was on Mona Vale Road. Is anyone from the Northern Beaches here of Sydney? All right, if I said Mona Vale Road, what picture comes into your mind? <coughs> Busy, noisy, correct? Right? If I said to you, um, are you familiar with Narrabeen at all? If I said Ocean Street, what comes into your mind then? Beach, Beach and quiet. Would you agree with that? Well, uh, um, the, the property that I was in faced three streets, right? The main entrance used to be on um, Mona Vale Road. But by, by redesigning it and making the entrance to that building um, on Ocean Street, what do you think it did to the marketing of that building? Put it up, oh, it sounds nice, it's on Ocean Street. But what do you think it did to the revaluations in there? Because now, who, what are you comparing it to? Properties on Mona Vale Road or properties on Ocean Street? And Ocean Street's had more expensive properties because they were literally across the, the park from the water rather than across a whole busy road and a block of housing and then to the, to the uh, beach. Does that make sense? So by just doing little things like that, you can actually get a great result. So really smart in doing that. Um, Oh, and are there some names of streets, and a current affair or Today Tonight had them, they're just awful like Bogan Street or things like that. Just god-awful names. Sorry? Grave Street, yeah. It's just, there are some much nicer ones. Okay. All right. Um, okay, Twin, uh, 36. Change title. Okay. In Sydney and in some parts of Melbourne, you don't get it as much in other um, capital cities, but who's heard the term company title? Put it, put it up. Like, not a lot of people. Okay. Company title, you might, it's just like, let's say, a block of apartments, usually older blocks in very established suburbs in the eastern suburbs generally of Sydney. Um, you may find that they're company title. Now, a company title, and it's not a company like an ASIC company, it's a special purpose company. It's not registered with ASIC at all. And in this special purpose company, um, it's really interesting if, let's say, Benjamin wanted to move in there, right? And he actually doesn't buy an apartment in there, 
He buys shares in the special purpose company and those particular shares have exclusive right to that property. Does that make sense so far? Now, interestingly, the rest of the shareholders, even if, um, what's your name, sir? Simon. Let's say Simon is the seller, Benjamin is the buyer. Right? Simon just wants to sell his property. But the rest of the shareholders in the company title can block Benjamin buying it. We don't like Benjamin. We just block him. So does that put you in a difficult position then, Simon? Puts him in a very, very difficult position. However, because of um, equal opportunities, um, Benjamin might um, complain and sue all of us because we you know, differentiated him because he's tall or something like that. I don't know. You know, whatever the reason, he could actually take um, legal action against it. So you don't get as much of it nowadays, but they often find ways to make sure they don't get the people they don't want in that building. So it actually is a restrictive. Plus, more importantly, when a bank tries to sell that off, it's not a physical asset. It's shares of a company that's not a real company. It's a special purpose company. So banks in the past have generally not lent quite as much um, against those, but most banks are now coming around, but you won't find a lot of those. But certainly the value improves once it goes from a company title to a normal strata title. Does that make sense? So there are some buildings that you may be able to find. That could even be a strategy that you do as part of your syndicate to find buildings to take that are company titles, convert them into strata title. You're going to have a whole lot of issues though, and that's why inspections are so important, because some of those things were built before the current standards were put in place. And to have a building the strata title, you may need, for instance, um, firewalling and you know, up in the ceiling space. There may be a whole lot of things, so it may not even be worthwhile doing.